friends this morning, I've written kind of a nerdy sermon, so I hope you're all ready for that. <laughs> we dive once again into a complicated text. In the sermon, it's the second in a two-part series on fiery scriptures. The texts literally mention fire. That's part of what makes them fiery. But they're also fiery in the ways that they challenge us. They're texts that we may find confusing or even uncomfortable. I came across a description in my studying this week for these sorts of texts that I really liked and I want to share. These texts are not problems to be solved, but rather adventures to be shared. So it's in that spirit that I invite us into the adventure this morning. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Let's start with a brief recap. Last week, we talked about Luke 12, 49 through 56, in which Jesus says, I have come to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. The theme for that sermon was be ignited. Be ignited by Jesus' message. Be ignited by the gospel of love. Be ignited to be a disciple of Christ in the world. Today's sermon theme is be consumed. As I mentioned, I got a little nerdy with the text this week, so I, I encourage you to have it in front of you, if possible, as we move through it. It's a dense passage. It's confusing sometimes, and I think it will help to have the words in front of you as we move through it. If you have your bulletin, it's on page 9. And this passage from Hebrews, it's structured as a series of comparisons. It compares two types of divine encounters, that at Mount Sinai and that at Mount Zion. It compares the blood of Abel and the blood of Jesus. It compares earth and heaven. And finally, it compares that which is shakable to that which is unshakable. Now, a word of caution when it comes to these comparisons. This is not, it's not about comparing what some might call the Old Testament God with the New Testament God. This is a common trope in Christian theology, contrasting a supposedly wrathful God in the Old Testament to a merciful God in the New. This is a false dichotomy. Yes, yes, we see different depictions of God throughout the Bible. However, God's judgment, God's anger, and God's mercy and love, they're present in both sets of texts. Furthermore, this sort of dichotomy, it sets one on a slippery slope toward an anti-Semitic theology, setting up a bad God of Judaism and a good God of Christianity. That reading, it's not faithful to what's written here in Hebrews, nor is it faithful to our interfaith relationships. Bearing this in mind, let's examine each of these comparisons in turn, starting with Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. Mount Sinai is not referenced by name in the text, but it is what's being referred to in verses 18 through 21. You have come not to something that can be touched, 
a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet. That's Mount Sinai. The mountain on which God receives, I'm sorry, on which Moses receives the Ten Commandments from God. Exodus tells us that story of God descending upon the mountain. The mountain, it's wrapped in smoke and fire and sounds echo out like the blare of a trumpet. It wouldn't be too far off to imagine standing at the base of a volcano. So the Hebrew people have gathered there and God tells them to keep this mountain holy. God sets some limits. Not just anyone can come up the mountain into the presence of the divine. Mount Zion, on the other hand, beckons us in with joy. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. <clears throat> Mount Zion refers to more than one thing in scripture. Mount Zion is a physical location in Jerusalem, home to many significant interactions between God and humans. It's also a way of talking about God's kingdom, both that in heaven and that part which we can glimpse now on earth. In today's scripture, Mount Zion is described as a festival-like gathering of angels and ancestors. Mount Zion is seen as a celebration and a place of holy belonging. If you notice, the text uses language of citizenship, actually, to describe how we all belong to this eternal city, how we all participate in this eternal city. The author is using this comparison between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion as a comparison between the fear of God and the celebration of God. Again, this has historically been used as a division between the Old Testament and the New Testament experiences of God. But if you think about it, fear of God and joy of God are present in both of those texts. The Hebrews, the ones who gathered at the base of Mount Sinai, they experience the joy of God as she leads them out of enslavement in Egypt. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, she experiences fear of God when an angel appears to tell the news of her conception. Think about the things we read around Advent and Christmas. The angels are always saying, do not fear. So rather than reading this as two different gods, we should read this as two different experiences with God. Here, we might ask ourselves two questions. When have I experienced the fear or the overwhelming awe of God? And when have I experienced the celebration of God? When I think of the fear of God, I think about space. I know on. We have you in the congregation, an award-winning astronomer and astrophysicist for whom the fear of the cosmos might sound a little silly, but I have to admit to you and to everyone, it really freaks me out. I feel deeply unsettled when I think about the infinity of space. When I think about how the same God who created and understands those depths and whatever they hold, created and understands me, that's a scary, awful, 
awesome, overwhelming thought for me. When I think about the celebration of God, I think about my ordination. Even though it was in those early days of COVID, it was such an amazing day. I felt such a profound joy. I felt so embraced and humbled by love and grace as all of these people who have been so important to my life reflected back to me my calling. I felt so seen and known by this congregation and other congregations I've served. It was a wonder that transcends words. We will all experience the fear and the celebration of God in our lives. We will all see Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. In invoking both of these locations, the author captures the range of experiences that we can have with the divine. Next, we come to this comparison between the blood of Abel and the blood of Jesus. The story of Abel and his brother Cain comes from the book of Genesis. Both brothers are called to make a sacrifice to God. And God prefers the sacrifice given by Abel. Cain becomes intensely jealous and in his rage murders Abel, his brother. Abel's blood represents greed, violence, and vengeance. And this blood marks Cain for the rest of his life. Jesus' blood marks something wholly different. Jesus' blood represents forgiveness, love, grace. You have come to Jesus, the text says, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Yes! <laughs> It does speak a better word. Forgiveness, love, and grace. Those are surely better words than greed, violence, and vengeance. The text, it's again describing experiences. Here describing for us the difference between a life marked by violence and one marked by grace. Implicit in this comparison between Abel and Jesus is a comparison between earth and heaven. The former reflects the earthly reality of violence, and the latter reflects the heavenly reality, the divine reality of love. This comparison between earth and heaven is then explicitly stated in verse 25. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them from earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? We hear the word of God from both earthly and divine messengers. We hear the word of God through human prophets. We can see the face of God through the teachings and ministry of Jesus in the poor and hungry and ailing around us. Last week, I talked about how as Christians, we must cultivate a mindset that allows us to interpret God in the present time. God communicates to us in manifold ways, but we must train our ears to hear the message. The author here issues a warning. There have been those in the past who failed to listen to the prophets, who failed to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. Will we, too, be those who fail to listen and to the message of God herself? This leads us right into the final comparison between shakable and unshakable things. At that time, his voice shook the earth. 
But now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken. That is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. There are things that last, and there are things that don't. There are things that stand, and there are things that will pass away. There are things that are shakable, material objects, wealth, status, expectations. I know I've had my expectations shaken a time or two. And then there are things that remain unshakable. God's love, God's grace, God's judgment. Here we come to the final piece of the text, what all of these comparisons led up to. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. We receive experiences of awe and celebration. We receive the forgiveness, love, and grace of Jesus. We receive the wonders of creation and the wonders of heaven. We receive an unshakable kingdom. Yet to receive all of this, we must open ourselves to God's consuming fire. And what in the world is that? What is God consuming? Sin. God consumes our sin. What does that mean? Well, Sin is anything that separates us from God, both things at the individual and the social level, both things we do and things we don't do. Here's some examples. When I want to cling to my possessions and put my trust in status, put my trust in all those degrees I worked so hard for, that's sin. When I believe that I'm worthless, or a mistake, or a bad creation, that's sin too. When we, as a society, collectively decide that homelessness, that that's just an acceptable reality that we're all going to live with, that's also a sin. Sin creates a false self, one that might be more acceptable to the world, but that's not the true self that God created. So God's fire, it purifies and removes that false self. It consumes all of the gunk that separates us from our God. And this is not a comfortable process. I can say that from experience. It's not comfortable to let go of our false selves. It's not comfortable to open ourselves up to an honest judgment of our actions and inactions. And the idea of a judgmental God may feel outdated. Didn't we move past that? Like, isn't church just supposed to make me feel warm and fuzzy? That might be something I'm working on as a preacher. I know I don't talk about sin and judgment all that much. But here's the truth of it. Judgment is important. It's important because it tells us that God cares about injustice. Right? God cares about righteousness. God cares about us. God cares about those other than us, which means that God also cares 
when we're separated, or when there's oppression, or when things are deeply wrong. I think here of two images that are presented in the scripture that India read for us, Psalm 71. The psalmist first presents God as a rock and a fortress, the unshakable God, the one we can lean on, rely on, plant our feet on and feel sturdy. Then the psalmist presents God as a midwife. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. God is constantly acting as a midwife in the world. God is laboring with us and birthing with us new realities of what can be. That is God's fire. God's consuming fire. God is bringing forth authenticity. God is bringing forth grace. God is bringing forth abundance. God is bringing forth justice. Our God is a consuming fire, removing that which cannot last so that something unshakable can grow in its place. This is a God worth worship. This is a God to, as the text says, stand before with reverence and awe. This is a God to follow with our heart and mind and being. So be consumed. Be consumed and see what God is bringing forth. Amen.